very good morning to one and all, and a special welcome to anyone who is with us this morning as a guest or visitor. We're glad that you could be with us. May the Lord bless you as we worship together. Just a couple of announcements quickly before we go to our pre-service song, and this is from the deacons. Uh, we, there is still a need for people to sign up for the Meals on Wheels program for the month of February. Uh, apparently, there's no one signed up at this time, and so please uh, think about it, pray about it, and um, if you can make an effort to, um, to help the deacons out uh, to deliver these Meals on Wheels for February, they would really appreciate it. I guess there must be a sign-up sheet in the back somewhere. Uh, also, the deacons wanted to mention that... Uh, Someone has mentioned that there is a fake email going around uh, from the Greens, uh, Bill and Aletha Green in uh, Costa Rica. Um, uh, it, apparently the email says they're in London and they're in need of money. Please send us money. And so if you do get this, uh, recognize that it is a fake email. It's not true. Uh, the deacons have uh, followed this up and they are, the Greens are safely in Costa Rica with uh, no need of any, uh, of any kind at this time. At this time, as we have come to worship the Lord our God, let us turn in our soul to hymnals to number 407 for our pre-service song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Number 407, we remain seated to sing the three stanzas. Our God calls us to worship with these words from Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He, he has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. In congregation, as we have come this morning once again into the house of our God to worship the everlasting God, let us bow in a moment of silent prayer and prepare our hearts for worship.
our opening hymn is number 348, O Glory, Lord, and Honor to Thee, Redeemer King. Number 348, let's rise to sing the three stanzas. Congregation, as we gather once again in the presence of our God, it is our heart's confession that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Let us listen once again this morning to the Ten Commandments as it comes to us from Exodus chapter 20. And as we saw last evening or last afternoon, the Ten Commandments are given and they still apply today to guide us in the way that God uh, uh, desires us to live as His holy people, as His consecrated people, and it uh, continually points us to our sin and our need for Jesus Christ and so that we never become self-satisfied or, or uh, contented with where we are um, or, and uh, always keeps us reaching forward, uh, looking uh, uh, for greater holiness and greater knowledge. And so let us listen to these words as they still apply to us today. Originally spoken to Israel at Mount Sinai, spoken by Moses, but uh, certainly the Word of God. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless, who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus Christ summarized these Ten Commandments for us in Matthew 22 into two great commandments. He said the first and great commandment is this, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and the second is like it, he said, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. They summarize all that the law teaches, all that the prophets taught. Well, having heard the law once again, let us be reminded that we listen to the law as God's people, as forgiven sinners, and as those who look to the Lord Jesus Christ, not for ourselves, not to ourselves as those who somehow strive to keep the law of God in order to gain or keep our salvation. We look to the Lord, the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the epistle of John, the first epistle of John, we hear these words, if we say that we have fellowship with Him, that is with Christ, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all our sin. Now later on we'll hear about this fellowship business once again. It'll come up again in the sermon. And uh, when we speak of fellowship, we're talking about a, a unity, a brotherhood, a, a oneness that we share. And who is a part of this fellowship, this oneness, this brotherhood, those who are joined to each other in Jesus Christ. And that is our relationship in Christ. Uh, it is not uh, necessarily, uh, or uh, it's not uh, bloodline, it's not, uh, uh, the connection is not uh, to race and language, ethnicity, or whatever it may be. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds, but we have a fellowship, we have a unity, a brotherhood in Christ. And um, certainly not based on similar interests or hobbies or uh, anything like that, but because we are sinners together, uh, who look to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for salvation and for the forgiveness of sins. And if we walk in the light together as Christ is in the light, then we do have that fellowship with one another, and we may be certain that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. With this in mind, let us turn in our hymnal to number 316. 316, number 316, Now thank we all our God. Let's remain seated to sing the first two stanzas only.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are humbled that you would call us sinners by nature into your presence this morning and remind us again of the fellowship that we share, the unity, the brotherhood, the oneness that is ours as a congregation and with the Church of Jesus Christ universal, that we are forgiven sinners that we are those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, that we are made right with you and declared righteous in your sight through faith in Jesus Christ, the faith that is given by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this wonderful gift of worship that we may gather together in this house of prayer and join our hearts together. Even though we have gone our different ways, we go by different last names, uh, we are of different ages, and yet, Father, we are one in Christ, and we may experience that oneness again as we worship you together. We thank you that the voices of our children may be joined with us, and we may see once again that the blessings that you bestow upon those who believe in Christ are passed on to, you, to our children as well. And that the promise is for us and our children and all whom you will call. We thank you for the faith that your Holy Spirit gives us. That we may see the Lord Jesus Christ and know that he is the Savior of the world. The Savior of sinners. And yet, Father, nevertheless, as we have once again come through another busy week full of responsibilities, perhaps worries and anxieties, we ask that you would... Assist us by your Holy Spirit to quiet our restless hearts before you and grant us once again in this morning hour a sense of awe of your holiness, of your greatness, and that you would help us to worship you with reverence and that we would be able to keep our minds and our focus and our attention upon what we are doing and in whose presence we are. Indeed, Father, as we join together this morning, and as you call us to worship, and as you announce your law before us, we are in the presence of your heavenly throne room, and our voices are joined with the angels who cry before you, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. And with the voices and the hearts of Christians everywhere on this day as they join together to worship you. Father, we praise you as the God of all glory, majesty, and power in whose hands are all things and who possesses all power. The mighty winds are at your command. The snow and the ice come when you beckon them. Indeed, Father, not a hair can fall from our heads, not a leaf falls apart from your knowledge. You are perfect in sovereignty. You rule by your providence, by which you bring to pass all that you know is good and best. You are not only the creator of all things, calling the world into being out of nothing, but you are also the savior of the world who called dead sinners and made us alive when we had nothing to offer, when we did not have as much as the ability to, to make one step, to utter a sigh, a single sigh in agreement with what you have done and who you are. We thank you that you have blessed us with such a Savior as Jesus Christ, whom you prepared throughout the Old Testament for the line of promise that you kept going so that in the fullness of time our Lord Jesus could be born into the world and that he could teach us so many things by his life, by his example, by his very words, even in the context of correcting others as we see this morning, that we may have in the finished canon of Scripture and in the New Testament the fullness of the revelation that you wanted us to have as your people. Bless us, Father, as we listen to your law once again and we are convicted that we may look to Christ once again and remember that we are forgiven sinners and that we may look to your Holy Spirit for help that we may live lives of faithfulness and obedience before you. 
Because as we, confess, as we look back on the past week, Father, we confess that at times we have possessed a spirit of discontent. Like Old Testament Israel, there are times in this past week when we have grumbled either audibly or in our minds and hearts, and we have complained about our situation. We, are, we were not satisfied with your timing as far as what we think should be happening in our lives. We did not exhibit or we have not felt the joy of our salvation at many times in this week, and we have allowed ourselves to become taken up by the anxieties of this past week. And there were many sins as well that we committed against you. And so we thank you that we may not only hear the law read this morning, but also the assurance of our pardon that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And we pray that you would help us now as we worship you this morning to look to you in rededication that we may seek in the coming week to go forward and to strive against sin, that we may live as, as obedient children before you and also as, as examples in this world to those around us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the health and strength that we have enjoyed. And thank you also for, for those of us who needed medical care that you did provide for us in the way of doctors and diagnosis and, and medication and procedures. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have blessed us this week again with the abilities that we have needed to fulfill our callings, and that you have blessed us with our daily needs of food and clothes and shelter and your protection. Thank you also for our spiritual needs, for the times when our faith has been very low, and we have needed your comfort and encouragement, when we have needed courage to take a stand and to do the right thing, and you have been with us with your Holy Spirit. And you have even convicted us when we have spoken uh, evil words, when we have thought wicked de uh, things, and we have, when we have done wicked deeds with our hands. We, we, ask, we thank you that there is forgiveness and that you have been near to us with, our, with your Holy Spirit to strike our conscience once again. We thank you for safety in a time of the year when there is danger, even as we walk around our yards and farms and in the workplace, when we drive the roads, when one act of carelessness or foolishness or distraction can cause serious injury or even death in these icy times, we thank you that you have watched over us. Thank you, Father, for your sustaining grace to those among us with ongoing health concerns and chronic illnesses. And we pray that you would continue to watch over them and visit them with your mercy and with your healing and continue to grant to each one patience. We pray for those who suffer during this time of, of cold weather with migraines. We pray for those who suffer with back pain and knee trouble and chronic tiredness and, and other things, Father, that are ongoing and difficult in their lives. We pray for your, your grace and mercy and that you would uphold them and carry them through each day and every week. We pray once again, Father, for the caregivers and for the loved ones of those who suffer continually. Give to them health and strength and uh, patience and the grace of your Holy Spirit as they too are in need of not only physical but uh, emotional and spiritual blessings from your hand. Father, we ask your blessing upon our sister, Ina Hammer, as she will travel to Calgary tomorrow with Haas we, uh, to have a visit with the surgeon uh, to get something of a, an assessment of her situation and what needs to be done next. We pray for safety on the roads for them as uh, they drive along, and we pray for uh, your blessing as, uh, as they visit with the surgeon, that it may be an encouraging visit, that they may... Uh, receives a word that uh, something can be done to alleviate our sister's uh, pain, back pain, and, and her ongoing suffering. Be near also to her with the arthritis that she has been experiencing and the tiredness, and also Haas with the dizziness that he has been experiencing as well. Be near to this couple and surround them with your, uh, with your goodness and your favor. We pray for our brother, Elder Brad Overeem, for his family as our brother developed complications this past week from an ear infection. We pray that the medication that he has been receiving, the antibiotics to clear up this infection, that it may do its work, and that when he receives a checkup again, that they, there may be no further um, difficulty, 
and uh, no complications or side effects, and we pray that you would bring him through this safely and that nothing else will be, would be affected by this uh, uh, infection that he has experienced. We also pray for his family, for your sustaining grace, and uh, uh, that you would be in the midst of them and carry them through. Uh, and all our young couples, our young parents, especially our young mothers, who have the daily task, the hourly task, to nurse, to change, to bathe, to cuddle, to comfort, and their work is ongoing. And Father, we pray that you would bless them with health and strength and all their needs from day to day and moment to moment. And bless our young fathers as well, that they may be able to keep up with work and home and church and family. We pray for those with child as well, and especially those who are nearing the time of childbirth, continue to watch over them and the covenant children in their wombs, and bless them that when the time comes, there may be safe deliveries and healthy children born to them as you so watch over and supervise. We pray for our infants, for your continued care upon them. We remember little Brinley. We thank you for the continued progress that she is making. We also think of all our little infants in this time of colds and flus, where colic hits the home. Uh, there, is, uh, there are all kinds of things that can affect them in their, in their, uh, in their uh, youngness and weakness, and we, posit, we pray for your protection upon them. We pray also, Father, that you would bless us in our marriages as husbands and wives as we seek to be blessed examples to each other and to our children, and that we may care for our children in such a way that they may see that indeed we seek to live as the Lord Jesus Christ commands us, and that we may raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and we may make those hard uh, sacrifices that we need to make to be godly examples before their eyes. And Father, as we think of our marriages, we think of the singles among us, those who are ready and willing to settle down and yet are waiting on your will to be revealed to them in terms of a life mate. We pray for patience, and we pray that you would open doors and point them in the direction that you want them to go. And Father, if it be your will that they would find such a one with whom they may settle down, that you would lead them and guide them and bring their paths together as you so marvelous, uh, marvelously do in, uh, in all our lives. We pray that you would bless them and grant them patience and contentment, uh, continue to keep them busy with the work of the church that you have given them to do, uh, that they may know that they are valued and they are uh, a blessing uh, to all of us in this congregation. Bless us in this hour, Father, as we once again open up your word as we look at Mark chapter 3 and as we uh, recall what is recorded for us concerning the life of Jesus, his experiences, and how he responded uh, to, uh, to the experiences and events of his life and how it affected um, uh, those around him and what we are taught by it. We pray that you would bless us as we listen to your word with attentive hearts, uh, accompany the preaching of your word with the sacred unction of your Holy Spirit, that we may hear you speak and that we, our hearts may be blessed as we listen to your word preached this morning. Bless your servant as well with clarity of uh, thought and speech, that this word may be brought with passion and with boldness be before the ears of your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, please turn with me for our scripture reading to Mark chapter 3 once again. Mark 3. We'll continue our reading. We stopped last time at Mark 3, 19, verse uh, a, uh, uh, 3, uh, 19a, and we'll pick up from 19b and read to the end of the chapter, verse 35. Mark 3, and so the second part of verse 19, 19b. And they, that is Jesus and his disciples, or his apostles who had been appointed um, at, uh, at the mountain, and they went into a house. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can plunder a strong man's house and plunder his goods. 
unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons, the sin, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Our song of preparation is number 462, Take My Life and Let It Be. Number 462, we rise to sing stanzas 1, 2, and 3 only at this time. I know a lot of people don't like to have the, to open the Bible again after and uh, after we've read it, and um, I always say, you know, please keep your Bibles open. I don't see a lot of Bibles being opened, but I would really, especially this morning, encourage you to open your Bibles um, and uh, just to follow along this morning because uh, there's there's certain things that uh, we need to to be able to see before us as we as we walk through this passage, and it is uh, a good number of verses, and so please, I would encourage you to open your Bibles and keep them open this morning as we listen to God's Word. Congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you may wonder why we're focusing on so many verses this morning, but we hope to see that all of these verses belong together, that they form one unit, and they make one point. And what is the one point that all of these verses from 19b to 35 is making? What is the one point that the opposition that Jesus continued to face in his ministry. And not only from the religious giants of his day, but even as we see, sadly, from his own relatives. And now verses 19b to 21, if you have your Bibles open, you can see that. Verses 19b to 21, and then verses tw uh, 31 to 35, they relay, they're part of, uh, they're, we, can, we might think of them as bookends, uh, of, of the whole story, uh, they start and begin this segment of uh, Scripture. Uh, and uh, So verses 19b to 21, and then verses 31 to 35, they relay one thing, the doubt of his family, and then Mark inserts the incident with the scribes in the middle of these bookends. Uh, what, what is he trying to show? He's showing that both the family of Jesus 
and the scribes had the same or similar opinions of Jesus. And what was their opinion? That he was somewhat out of his mind. And what shines forth in this passage once again is the absolute dedication of Jesus to his earthly ministry. We have to, in a manner of speaking, be fascinated and even marvel at, at the dedication of Jesus, how he stays the course and he continues to, to seek to finish the race for which he had come, even in, in spite of such opposition. Because if we put this in a, in a personal context, we think of ourselves, you know, how many of us would become very discouraged if we did not have the support of, say, our loved ones, or people who we would think we need their support, we would like to have their support. How many of us would be very, become very discouraged and lose our enthusiasm, lose our zeal if we were not getting that support? Think, for instance, maybe as husbands, when you set out in marriage and you had plans and you told your wife, you know, we're moving to Canada and we're going to buy this farm and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And you had this, all these great and grand plans in your mind. Maybe as a young man now, you're already having these conversations about things about that are going to happen in the years to come. What if just once you looked at your wife and you saw doubt in her eyes? And what you saw, maybe she tried to hide it, but maybe, maybe even for a brief moment, you saw that she did not believe in you. How would we react to that? I mean, you go from there, to, you plunge right to the bottom right away, right? You, you kind of lose courage because, yeah, especially for, for us, you know, I can have a, a million people tell me, good job. When my wife tells me, then it means something to me. And we as husbands, we know about, we know, uh, and husbands as wives, we, we know. We need the encouragement of our spouse in that way. How, as young people perhaps, um, how we would plummet to the depths of despair if, you know, we, we have our minds uh, fixed on something, a career that we want to pursue, somewhere we want to go, some studies that we have uh, that we want to, to accomplish in our lives, and we're giving it our all. We're doing everything possi humanly possible to get this accomplished. And then one day dad says, I, son, I, I don't think you have what it takes to do this. Uh, your mom says, you know, I, I don't think this is for you, my, my dear daughter. You know, how we would plummet to the depths of despair. And so, we, in a sense, we can relate to, to, the, temp, to the temptations that was, that was facing Jesus at this time. Jesus was working night and day, tirelessly, to usher in the kingdom of God, to bring salvation into the world. And his own family thought that he had lost his mind. And the scribes, the religious scholars, the supreme wise men of that day said of him, he's aligned with the devil. And yet Jesus kept going. He never threw in the towel. He never gave up. He never abandoned his mission. And so, so this morning, we want to summarize what we learn here in this passage with, these, with this theme. Jesus experiences opposition to his kingdom ministry. Jesus experiences opposition to his kingdom ministry. We'll see in the first place from his own family and in the second place from the scholars of his day. Two very uh, great sources of, 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 uh, that could be potentially very discour discouraging to Jesus. But we see in the first place that Jesus experienced opposition from his own family to his kingdom ministry. And we saw last time that the appointing of the 12 apostles, and this took place, we said, on a mountain. We're not sure which mountain. Mark then picks up the story upon their return. Verse 19b tells us that Jesus and the disciples went into a house. Now, most likely it was the same house that we've read before where people had crowded to and they were blocking the door. Nobody could come in and out. And so uh, they had to tear the roof open to let the paralytic man down. Most likely it was the same house. And if it was the same house, it was most likely the house of Peter where Jesus had healed his mother-in-law of a fever. And this would be in the town of Capernaum. But we read that having come into this house, the crowds, the multitude, descended upon that house once again. Most likely, they were coming and they desired to be healed by Jesus. But hopefully, uh, they came also to hear him preach and teach. Either way, Jesus and his disciples were kept very busy. There was such a non-stop non stream of people coming to him. So many pleas and cries for help continually. So much sorrow that came to the door of this house that they could not as much as stop to eat. 
And this tells us a couple of things about Jesus again. It tells us, first of all, of the power of Jesus that he possessed that was so clearly seen by so many that people kept coming to him in droves. They saw that he had the power to bring them relief from their suffering. And it tells us something of the compassion of Jesus who could not bear to leave these people in their suffering for even a few minutes to satisfy his own hunger. And remember, Jesus was fully human. He was fully divine, but he was also fully human. He was also in the flesh, and so he had bodily needs. He needed nourishment and nutrients to keep him going. But his compassion for, for the people who came to him was so great that he could not bear to see them suffer, even for a few minutes, so that he could get a bite to eat. But sadly... While all these people were seeking Jesus to help them, his own family came seeking him because they believed he needed help. In verse 21 we read, But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is out of his mind. Now literally the Greek says, not uh, his own people. It literally it says, those alongside of him. And so scholars debate as to what exactly this means. Uh, literally, it says those alongside of him. We might say those who were nearest to him. And so we believe that it, it, it was, uh, it's speaking of, Mark is speaking here of his family. And we know that because verse 31 tells us that his brothers and his mother came. And they come in what John Calvin calls a wicked conspiracy to lay hold of Jesus. And the Greek verb can mean to arrest to seize, to grasp, and to retain. It's used, for instance, in Matthew 12, verse 11, where Jesus talks about a sheep falling into the pit, and a, a person would not leave that sheep in the pit. You would lay hold of that sheep, and you would pull him out. You're not giving him a little pat on the back. You're grabbing hold of him, you're grasping him, you're holding firm, and you're pulling the sheep out. That's what they came to do with Jesus. The same word is used of, uh, in Acts 3, verse 11, of the lame man who held on to Peter, seeking uh, Peter, healing him. And when he was holding on to Peter, he wasn't just giving a gentle pat that Peter could just pull away. The Bible gives a sense he was grabbing on and holding on. I will not let you go until you do something for me. That's what they came to Jesus uh, to do. That was their intention of his mothers and brothers to grab hold of him and to take him back home, perhaps even by force if necessary. Why would they think such a horrible thing? Why would, why would they concoct such a horrible plan? Well, Mark tells us in verse 21, when they heard. When they heard. Literally, when they heard. Well, heard what? Well, they heard what everyone else was hearing. Because, of course, the news of what Jesus was doing, the things he was saying, was spreading like wildfire throughout uh, Galilee and throughout Judea. We've seen that in uh, sermons uh, in, past, in the past uh, verses before. What was everyone else hearing? What was, the, the, what was the, uh, the talk that was going around about this Jesus? That Jesus was being seen by people as a great healer. This is the carpent, carpenter's son from Nazareth. They were hearing what everybody else was hearing, that Jesus was forgiving people as if he was God, because of course he was God. His family was hearing that Jesus was healing people on the Sabbath and he was allowing his disciples to pluck grain on the sacred day of rest, and he was not making his disciples fast like the disciples of the Pharisees and John the Baptizer. They were hearing that he was challenging and shaming the religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he was associating with tax collectors and sinners. And so they hear all of this, and they thought, well, there's only one explanation for all of this. He must be mad. He must have lost his mind. He must have developed some kind of Messiah complex. Now, Jesus, we have to understand, was not the first servant of God to be thought of in this way and treated in this way. Think of the story of Joseph when he told his brothers his dreams. And they saw him coming in a distance when his father sent him to check up on them. What did they say? Look at that dreamer. Here's the dreamer coming. They didn't believe in him. In Numbers 12, we read of the sister and brother of Moses, Miriam and Aaron, speaking against him. And then in Numbers 16, we read of Korah's rebellion, accusing Moses of exalting himself over the congregation, in a sense, mad with power. Elisha is called a madman 
by one of Ahab's servants. And we can read about that in 2 Kings 9.11. Elisha, the prophet Elijah, the servant of God, is called a madman by one of Ahab's servants. The apostle Paul would be accused by the governor Festus. And we can read about this in Acts 26, that he was beside himself. That's um, the same verb in the Greek. And that's what the literal meaning is you are outside of yourself or beside, beside yourself. You've lost your mind, we would say. Um, the apostle Paul would be accused by the governor Festus in Acts 26 of this, that his great learning was driving him mad. And his heretical opponents, apparently, was accusing him of being mad as well. And he records this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 13, that he was beside himself, that he was insane. And so when we put all of this together and we see this accusation being launched even against Jesus, we're reminded that this too is a, is a tool that Satan uses when all else fails to accuse God's servants of insanity, of not being in their right mind. And even Jesus was on the receiving end of this. And this was a pathetic attempt by the evil one to discredit Jesus. His own family would think him deranged. And so in a sense, why would people believe in him if his own family is saying he's, he's, he's lost his mind? And John records in his gospel in John 7 verse 5 that, his, that the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him. Now we know that in time to come they would place their faith in him. How do we know that? Acts 1. We read that Mary and his brothers were among the 120 that assembled in Jerusalem to pray and wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so they did finally believe in Jesus, but at this particular time, they doubted him. And they sought to take him away with them back to their hometown, lest he embarrass the family anymore. And again, congregation, how painful this must have been for Jesus. And yet, he uses this, not to lash out at them, but as a teaching opportunity. We read in verses 32 and following that when he is told that his mother and brothers are outside, he responds in verse 33 and following, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now what are we taught here? We're taught here by Jesus himself that there is a bond that is closer than even family ties. There is a relationship that is stronger than even what we have with our blood relatives. And that's not to lessen the worth of families, don't get me wrong. God, after all, is the originator of families. It is he who gives us spouses. It is he who says to us, be fruitful and multiply. It is he who blesses us with families and passes on his promises to our children and our children's children. And yet Jesus teaches us here that we are to have more regard for our spiritual family than even our own family. Jesus would later on say at another time, whoever loves father, mother, brothers, or sisters more than me is not worthy of me. Now, why, why does Jesus speak this way? Because there is something that, that uh, ties human beings together that is even stronger than blood. And that is our common faith. As believers, we are related by our common, God-given desire to do the will of God. Jesus says, whoever does the will of God is my mother and brother and sister. And so we have to ask, what is the will of God? What is the will of God? Well, there are several things we could say about that. One of the places we could uh, listen to is John 6, verse 40. Jesus says, And this is the will of him who sent me. John 6, verse 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so first and foremost, the will of God and so we're talking here about doing the will of God. Whoever does the will of God is the father, is the mother and brother or sister of Jesus and of each other. And so the first thing we uh, want to see is that the will of God is that we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior. But we also learn in places like 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 that God's will is that we be sanctified, that we be cleansed, that is uh, continually washed and renewed from our sins. God's will is that we are sanctified. Paul writes as well in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 that the will of God is that we give thanks in everything. And so we are to live thankful lives always and joyful lives. And Paul even goes on to speak of those who oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
as those who have been taken by or taken captive by Satan to do his will. He says that in 2 Timothy 2 verse 26. And so if we believe in Jesus and by his spirit we are striving to obey God's commandments and if we are fighting against sin by the help of his Holy Spirit we are related to each other with this powerful bond and therefore how does that translate into how we should look at each other and react to each other we should then hold each other in the highest regard that means practically speaking that we ought always to be seeking the good of the household of Christ as much maybe even more as our own families it means that we ought to be pursuing unity and peace within the congregation it means that we should avoid at any cost anything that would be divisive and, and divide the congregation and bring disunity in the congregation it means that we should love one another as believers with a holy love a love which moves us to seek the good of each other always and we must be looking for opportunities to serve the church of Jesus Christ it means that we must be praying for each other and being hospitable and helpful to each other and when we look around us in the congregation and in the Christian church at large we must see as Jesus instructs us here sons and daughters brothers and sisters mothers and fathers because that's how Jesus views those who do his father's will that's why he leaves his own mother and brothers outside because at this time they were not doing his father's will but their own but we see in the second place that Jesus experienced opposition to his kingdom ministry also from the religious leaders in verse 22 we read this and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said he has Beelzebub and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons now we've talked about the scribes before the scribes were the wise men of their day they were the scholars they were the respected uh, experts in the law people looked to them for guidance they knew the Old Testament backwards and forwards and they knew how, to, how, they, uh, how, to, how the Old Testament was to be interpreted and so the scribes we read came down from Jerusalem and we have to understand we can take that literally as well because Jerusalem was built on an elevated height about 2600 uh, um, uh, uh, feet above sea level much higher than anywhere in Galilee and so they came, literally came down from, uh, from Jerusalem perhaps they were called or invited by the Pharisees to give their opinion to make an assessment of this Jesus of Nazareth and the things there he's doing maybe they were delegated sent by the Sanhedrin which was the ruling body of the Jewish religion at that time located in Jerusalem again to make an assessment of this Jesus character and what he was doing and so they come down in their wisdom and we would say worldly wisdom not wisdom led by the Holy Spirit and they come down and they look at the situation and they listen to what is going on and they say well what what's this let me let, let us hear what this Jesus is doing he's, he's commanding demons to leave people that they possessed he is silencing demons with a word just his word just a command and the demons are calling him the son of God the unclean spirits are falling down before him hmm he's healing people you say well here's what we think in our esteemed opinion he has Beelzebub by the ruler of demons he casts out demons that was their scholarly assessment of what Jesus was doing Jesus could only be casting out demons and tossing them out on their heads because the one who rules them gave him this power how ridiculous and again we have to see Satan's hand behind this always seeking to strike at the heel of the seed of the woman these were these were the learned men we have to understand that these were the men who people looked to for guidance who were studied and scholared these were the men whose word could either make or break a man these were the men to whom the Jews looked to determine truth from error and what is their assessment of Jesus they said this Jesus is a friend of the devil and again amazingly Jesus doesn't call down fire from heaven upon them though he could 
He doesn't command the ground to open up and swallow them as God did in the days of Korah when they opposed Moses. What does Jesus do? He reasons with them. In verses 23 to 29, he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is subject to eternal condemnation. Now, few things to notice here. Notice, first of all, that Jesus calls them to himself. And the word in the Greek, the Greek verb translated call, refers to a commanding summons, a commanding summons. It's the kind of summons as a boss when you, when you tell somebody, go tell Mike I want him in my office right now. There's no argument. There's no debate. Boys and girls in the house, when, when mom or dad calls you, there's no discussion. There is no debate about it. They want you in their presence and they want you now. In their God-given authority, they are demanding your presence and you have to come. Well, in the same way, the same sense of this Greek word. Jesus, in his divine authority, calls. He, com he commands them. He summons them to himself. He uh, calls the scribes to himself, and they come. They have no choice in the matter. They are drawn to Jesus by his sure, sheer authority. Notice as well that Jesus speaks to them in parables. And a parable, boys and girls, is like a story that you can picture in your mind. You know, if we, I wanted to make an example for you, and I, I say, well, there was a man who was driving a chariot down the highway, and one of the wheels broke, and his donkey couldn't go any further. You know, you can picture it in your mind, but it's not just a story. There's a deeper meaning to it, and deeper implications. And so a parable, Jesus would often use these parables, words uh, that would picture something in somebody's mind, but with a deeper significance, a deeper meaning. And in his address to them, as he uses these parables, Jesus does three things, if you notice. Uh, the first thing he does with them is that he shows them how illogical their conclusion is. He shows the scribes how illogical, how unreasonable, how ridiculous their conclusion was. In the second place, he explains how he is able to do what he had been doing. And third, he then gives them a word of warning. Well, first of all, how did he show them that their conclusion was illogical, it was insensible. He asked them, first of all, how can Satan cast out Satan? And we, we can picture that. Someone trying to cast themselves out of something. Now, if, if we have someone come over to our house, and for some reason or another, um, they become rowdy, situation of tension develops, we want them to leave. We want them out of our house. We can say, okay, I want you out of my house right now. I want you to leave. And they have to listen because this is our house. This is my house. And if they don't, what do we do? We pick up the phone. We call 911. We say, can you send somebody to get this person out of my house, right? I want this person cast out of my house. But can we imagine throwing ourselves out of our house? Demanding that we leave immediately. Well, what a ridiculous picture. What do we do? Grab ourselves by the collar and say, out varmint, vacate these premises right now before I really get rough. Is that how we throw ourselves out of our own house? We cast ourselves out? Or do we call the cops and say, I want you to get me out of my house right now? You see how silly that is. And that's what Jesus exposes with the scribes. But that's what they were suggesting, that Satan was behind Jesus' abilities to cast out Satan. And in fact, he was casting himself out, throwing himself out of his own house. It made no sense. How could the devil be working against himself? Why would he undo his own efforts? It was utter foolishness. That would be like a, a house divided against itself or a kingdom that was divided against itself. If the Hatfields and the McCoys are feuding and the Hatfields keep shooting each other in the back, they're going to lose the war. Or if dad in the house says no dating until the children are 18 and mom says no when they're 16 that's fine with me and they both are digging in their heels it's going to be chaos in that house 
If the church says no and the parents say yes, it's not good, especially if it's a very important spiritual issue. Think of the troubles that are going on in the Ukraine. Again, still, uh, uh, we saw it last night on the news. So there are some who are loyal to their country, the Ukraine. Some are loyal to Russia. And so it's a house divided, a kingdom divided. Or think of those Islamic countries. They presumably practice the same religion. But you have Shiites and you have Sunnis bombing each other, killing each other. It makes for utter chaos. And a kingdom like that cannot stand. But where there is unity, a common goal and purpose, there is peace and there is progress. And so how could Satan be working against himself, says Jesus to the scribes? It just doesn't make sense. Well, the second thing he teaches them in parables is he goes on to explain to them how he really is able to cast out demons. And he says this in verse 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Again, something we can picture. We hear it on the news all, time, all the time. Last night again, we heard of a, a, a break-in in Edmonton where some people came into somebody's house and they bound them and they, there was some beating up that went uh, along and uh, maybe some robbing that went on. But we hear that, thing, uh, that kind of thing happening all the time. A robber enters a house, he ties up the owners, he steals their possessions. Well, he has to subdue them first because you're not going to hand over your possessions willingly uh, to someone who comes into your house. Well, Jesus talks here about entering the strong man's house. And the strong man here, in the original Greek, pictures one who is able to keep his house safe by his sheer strength, by his sheer ability. So we're talking here about someone who is not a pushover, a weakling, someone who is not able to protect his own house. He is the kind of dude we would not want to mess with, we might say. And Satan is likened to that strong man. He has power on earth, of course. He is called, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, the God of this world. Jesus calls him the prince of this world in John 12, verse 31. Peter pictures Satan as a roaring lion. And so Satan is not to be taken lightly. He is indeed, he was indeed a strong man. Jesus did not take Satan lightly at any time. And yet at the same time, Jesus was able to cast out Satan's demons because he had entered his house and he had bound him. Well, when did Jesus enter Satan's house? Well, in his incarnation, when he entered this earthly realm, when uh, he left behind the glories of his divinity and he came uh, to, into, this, into history, broke into history, into our time uh, to walk among us. And so he entered the strong man's house and then with the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit, he then triumphed over Satan's temptations where in the wilderness, as we saw earlier. And so Satan at this time had no power over Jesus. In fact, he had now been rendered powerless against him. And that is how Jesus was able to cast out demons. That's how he was able to plunder Satan's house, to take his possessions. That is, those who he had held in captive, those he thought was his own, Jesus was able to enter Satan's house, bind him, and take them away for himself. A third thing that Jesus teaches them, describes in parables, is he also issues a warning to them, a word of caution um, to them. And uh, if we go by Matthew 12, the Pharisees were there as well. And so Jesus offers a word of caution to the scribes and the Pharisees. In verses 28 to, 20, to, to 30, Jesus says, I, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he, who, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. And then Mark gives the explanation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. Now, Jesus begins his point to them with the word assuredly. In the Greek, that's amen. We say the word amen at the end of our prayers. Jesus would often say amen at the beginning of uh, his speech when he was going to say something. And the word amen means truly, surely, what I'm about to, you, to, to say to you is true and it is trustworthy. You can take it to the bank. And so Jesus would say, amen, amen, truly, truly, verily, verily, in the old King James Version, I say to you. And so what he was about to say to them must be seen as true and trustworthy. And what was that? He says, all sins will be forgiven. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has no forgiveness. Even the, the heinous sin of blasphemy, which is, boys and girls, speaking against God, 
or causing God's name to be mocked. That can be forgiven. But he says, all sins will be forgiven, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Now that's a scary verse. And many a Christian is terrified of committing that sin. Maybe you've had a, a conversation with someone who said, I think I, I committed the sin of, the, of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so we, we need to know what that sin is. Well, the context of this tells us because the scribes were doing what? They were attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. They were attributing the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. In other words, they were saying that Satan did something that the Holy Spirit actually did. They looked at God's work and they said of Jesus in verse 30, Jesus has an unclean spirit. And so they, in a way, calling the, the, the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit, equating him with the spirits of the devil. And that is intolerable in the sight of God. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is speaking against God after his power has been clearly revealed. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is speaking against God after his power has been clearly revealed or denying God his glory even though we have seen it clearly displayed. Now, this is not talking about of the backslider or even the occasional backslider and certainly the truly converted will never be allowed to sin such a sin that they would lose their salvation that's an impossibility this is talking about a person who has been exposed to the spirit's gifts and power and was convicted though obviously not converted who then speaks evil against him and John Calvin speaks of such a one as purposely and maliciously turning light into darkness. He says that he or she has turned the perfections of God to dishonor. When he or she ought to be uh, celebrating, they set out to be enemies of God. And they turned the only medicine of salvation into poison, Calvin says. They turned the only medicine of salvation into poison. The book of Hebrews help, helps us a little bit as well, too, in clarifying what is meant here. Hebrews 6, verses 4 and following, 4 to 8. The apostle writes, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Now listen to this part, verse 7 and 8. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. And so first, on the, on the one hand, you have the earth which drinks in the rain. That is like the, the person who sits under the preaching of the word and by the Holy Spirit you drink it in and then you bear fruit for God. But then he gives the other side if it bears thorns and briars. And so that Christian then turns around and and does not bear fruit for God, in fact, makes trouble for God, speaks against Him and works against Him. If it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So fearful words. And so th this is speaking of those who have tasted the goodness of God and then walking away. They have tasted of the goodness of God. They have seen and they have heard. They have been enlightened to a certain extent that what God has done, what God has said, what Jesus has done, there is truth to that. They have experienced it in their minds, though they were never 100% converted. And so in a sense, they may say, yeah, I know it's true, but I, I just don't believe it. And I, I don't want nothing to do with the church. And the church is for people who want to waste their time for a bunch of fools. It, it's kind of like, uh, maybe we could put it this way. It, it's like someone who knows that water quenches thirst but then chooses to eat dirt because I, I just want to. Like a person who knows that water quenches thirst, but then chooses to eat dirt because I just want to. Uh, here was the warning for the scribes then. What they were doing was blasphemy against the Holy Spirit it's because his power was clearly being displayed in the work of Jesus, and they were denying it, and they were saying, this was the work of Satan. It's by Beelzebub that he casts out demons. And Jesus says there is no forgiveness for that. Calvin says that this is a warning also for all of us. And he reminds us of what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands watch out lest he fall. 
Jesus also would command us in John 15 to abide in the vine, remain in the vine. That is, it's to draw our strength from him because here's what we're reminded here. This is the point of Calvin from this. The most religious man, he says, can become guilty of the vilest sin. The most religious man can become guilty of the vilest sin. That's why we're uh, continually called in the Bible to be on guard and to watch ourselves and to stay in the vine, uh, remain in Jesus, and uh, not uh, let, uh, let him who thinks he stands watch out lest he fall. In congregation, Jesus, of course, was prophesied to be a man of sorrows, despised and rejected by men, and we see that already in the early part of his ministry, he was experiencing that. This was not reserved for his final days or even final hours of his life. We see him this morning on the receiving end of doubt and unbelief from the re respected religious leaders and from his own family. And yet, again, amazingly, even the lack of faith of those who were closest to him and the unbelief of those who should have seen in him every promise of God fulfilled, None of this deterred him. None of this turned him back. He kept, as we would say, he kept his head in the game. He never lost focus. He met the challenges. Let us then not doubt him, nor in any way take away from his perfection. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for the dedication, the perseverance, and the zeal of Jesus, who never doubted, never become, became fearful, never became discouraged, never second-guessed your will for him, but kept going. And we thank you that through the power of your Holy Spirit, with whom you anointed him, when he was baptized by John, that, he, that Jesus was able to experience triumph over every obstacle that Satan put in his way, whether it be from the religious leaders or even his own family. And we thank you that in Jesus, we too, have experienced triumph over sin, and we too may experience triumph over the daily sins of our lives. Help us to believe in him, help us to exalt him, help us to never doubt him, or in any way take away from his perfect salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 462, stanzas 4, 5, and 6 is our song of response. Take my life and let it be. We return to number 462. We rise to sing stanzas 4, 5, and 6. Lord has his ways of keeping me humble. Please turn with me um, in the booklets to page 33. 
uh, where we will read the formulary for the uh, preparation for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Form number two, as we look forward to um, celebrating the Lord's Supper next, Lord's Day, Lord willing. Page 33 in, in the liturgical forms booklet. <laughs> Let us read the form. Beloved in Jesus Christ, since we hope next Lord's Day to celebrate the blessed sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we are called to prepare our hearts by rightly examining ourselves. For the Apostle Paul has written, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let each one then examine his life and considering his own sin and the wrath of God on it, be sure that he humbles himself in repentance before God. Let each one examine his heart to be sure that he trusts in Jesus Christ alone for his salvation, believing his sins are forgiven wholly by grace for the sake of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Finally, let each one examine his conscience to be sure that he resolves to live in faith and obedience before his Lord and in love and peace with his neighbor. All those who do not repent, do not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, and have no desire to lead a godly life, are warned, according to the command of God, to keep themselves from the holy sacraments. If any one of us, living in disobedience to Christ and in, en and in enmity with his neighbor, he must repent of his sin and reconcile himself to his neighbor before he comes to the Lord's table. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. The solemn warning is not designed, however, to discourage penitent sinners from coming to the holy sacrament. We do not come to the supper as though we were righteous in ourselves, but rather to testify that we are sinners and that we look to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Although we do not have perfect faith, do not serve and love God with all our hearts, and though we do not love our neighbors as we ought, we are confident that the Savior accepts us as, at his table when we come in humble faith, with sorrow for our sins, and with a will to follow him as he commands. And since it is necessary for us to come to the sacrament in good conscience, I urge any who lack this confidence to seek from the minister or any elder of this church such counsel as may quiet his conscience or lead to the conversion of his life. All then who are truly sorry for their sins, who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and who earnestly desire to lead a godly life, ought to accept the invitation now given and come with gladness to the table of their Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ and provided a most wonderful communion with him through the mystery of the sacrament, we need your grace to enable us to prepare our hearts for the reception of Holy Communion. To all who sincerely believe in your Son and truly repent of their sins, grant us assurance of your gracious readiness to receive and bless us in the Supper of our Lord. To all who have not yet repented and have not put their trust in the Lord Jesus, grant a restraining fear of this Supper, lest their condemnation be greater. But have mercy upon these, and grant them grace to repent of their sins and seek their salvation in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We confess, O Father, that we have all offended your majesty and deserved your judgment. We have transgressed in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Truly, there is no strength in us. Be merciful, O God, and grant us your pardon, and let us come to the sacrament in the joy of your forgiving love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with the Holy Spirit, our only God, lives and reigns forever. And Father, as we continue to worship you by the giving of our offerings, we pray bless us in this. And bless us as we give to what the work of the voice of the martyrs. We thank you for the information that they bring to us uh, in the bulletin and on their website and through their magazine. And we thank you that we may be uh, made aware of the suffering of our brethren all across the world. We think this morning of the uh, those uh, Christians, the minority in Niger. Uh, we pray for them, Father, as they have been subject to much atrocity by uh, Muslim fundamentalists and radicals and terrorism, Father. We pray for the consolation of their hearts, 
We pray that you would protect them, protect the church there, and bless Christians all across the world where there is great hostility and violence being exercised against Christians, that they may stand firm in their faith, and that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ may continue to be announced. Bless us then as we give to what this very worthy cause. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's right. Congregation, lift up your hearts to heaven and receive the Lord's blessing as we part. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Amen. Our doxology is stanza three of number 316. <laughs> 